Athlete Mindset is part of the CadSource Podcast Network. At CadSource, we love podcasts. In fact, we love building podcasts, everything from development to production. Because of all that, we're growing this one-of-a-kind podcast network. If you have a podcast or looking to launch a new podcast, then we should talk. You can message me on Twitter at Eric underscore Kaz or hit us up any way that works for you by searching CadSource on your social media app of choice. Let's talk about your podcast joining this one-of-a-kind podcast network, the CadSource Podcast Network. This is the Athlete Mindset Podcast, and it's all about mental health in sports. Presented and produced by Sports E Plus, part of the CadSource Podcast Network. Athlete Mindset is hosted by Lisa Bontasumi. Lisa is a therapist and mental performance consultant to high-performing athletes at the youth, collegiate, and professional levels. Lisa also works with teams, coaches, and other members of the sports ecosystem. The Athlete Mindset Podcast is a space for conversations with athletes, coaches, practitioners, and stakeholders in sports. And it's where those individuals share their perspectives, experiences, and thoughts on mental health in sports. I am Eric Kazimov, founder of CadSource and the creator of Sports C+. I'm hosting the Athlete Mindset Podcast on this platform as I deeply believe these conversations are essential and deserve to be prioritized. Hi, Nate. Hello, hello. How are you? I'm good, and you? I'm good. Just living my best life. <laughs> That's the hope for all of us, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it. Sure. I appreciate, you know, Eric connecting us and just another opportunity for you to like, you know, share your heart, share your story. You know, I mm-hmm. think that's valuable for me and for anyone who who wants to listen and cares to listen. I've learned a little bit about you through Eric. And so I think there's a lot of ways we can go about it. You know, want it to be just like a conversation, like we're sitting having coffee or something. There it is. We'll keep it like that. So we're all good. Yeah, totally. So what I do know is that you played for Ohio State back in 2007 to 2011. You were a safety mm-hmm. and you were under Coach Trussell at the time. Yep. I know that there was a special kind of relationship there that you had with him. Could you mm-hmm. share a little bit about that relationship? Yeah, absolutely. So Coach Truss, I guess any player that has played under Truss, I think probably has a similar relationship just because that's just kind of who he is as an individual. I know it sounds cliche, but he was more than that coach. He was that father figure away from home. He made you think about things outside of just, you know, football. You know, he made sure that whenever we would go out, whether it was going to class, he wanted us to be respectable young men and sit up front if we can, obviously get there uh, 15 minutes early because, you know, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. Right, right. And just make sure that you treated people the right way. Treated people like the way you wanted to be treated because he, he knew that being an Ohio State football player, you ultimately can decide and really affect many people just by interacting with them a certain way. So mm-hmm. he just made sure that we, we treated everyone the way that we wanted to be treated. And as far as like personally, uh, what he's done for me, I mean, during that time transitioning from high school into uh, college, you know, Coach Trussell, And the Ohio State football team were really my rock, my foundation, just because uh, there was a lot of things that happened going into college from uh, my grandfather passing away and then my uncle passing away two months after that. And then my father and my stepmother getting a divorce. And then I'm leaving the house. There was just a lot going on and probably a, uh, I would say a five to six month period to where like, I'm supposed to be on top of the world, super excited, going to the Ohio State University to go and live out your dream and pursue not only college education, but also your NFL dream. And it was like, hey, just kidding. You got to deal with this first. So just going through that entire thing and going through my growing pains as a player, as that was going on, Coach Tressel obviously knew the background on that. And I would say gave me a little leeway. Huh. By little, I mean like this much. <laughs> still, still was being held accountable. But him understanding those pieces outside of the game were huge. And yeah, man, I, I just remember going into my red shirt uh, senior year. And unfortunately, it was uh, the spring, uh, I think it was spring 2011. And he ended up 
resigning uh, right after spring ball, unfortunately. But uh, going into um, that spring ball, you know, there was just a lot going on. I'm a senior, probably, I mean, I know for a fact I was playing tight, you know what I mean? So uh, I remember one practice, I ended up, you know, doing something I wasn't supposed to do that I would normally not do, but just playing tight, not really thinking. Uh-huh. Um, ended up getting pulled out because it was like a third down situation. I messed up. I mean, I did myself. Don't I mean it happened and uh, got pulled. And essentially, one coach kind of looked at me and was like, "You know, Nate, you're a senior. You're supposed to know better. Like, what are you doing?" And like at that point, like in my eyes, I was just kind of like broken. Like I'm playing tight. I know I got everybody, you know, depending on me at home, and I want to be perfect. And it just didn't really work out for me. But you know, the very next day, I sat down at Coach Trestle's office and like just wanted to talk about football. And as I began to speak, I just break down, boo-hoo, cry, mm-hmm. nasty, snot, you know, that kind of thing. And, <laughs> the messy you know, cry. I, yeah, yeah. After I had my moment, you know, he just kind of looked at me and said, you know what, Nate? I don't want anything other than that kid that I recruited out of St. Ed's. I don't need you to be anyone else but that guy. And I can't explain to you what exactly happened after that, but I was just lights out. From that point moving forward, like the pressure was gone, everything was gone. He just wanted me to be the kid that he recruited out of St. Ed's. And that conversation and that moment was huge. And I always tell people this, but I believe that if he was there my senior year, it would have been a lot different for my record, but also just the way I played would have been a lot different just because of that one conversation. And I can't explain it other than those words that he said just had so much power to release all the pressure and everything else that was going on, it just went away. And I was able to actually just go and just play football. So, yeah, that's kind of the story right there. I mean, there's a lot of stories that you've just told. I'm going to ask you some, uh, a little bit oh, yeah. more I questions. It was a lot. It was a I, lot. Why? Like, I love it. Like, thank you. Thank you for being so open and free. How did it feel when Coach Truss, you know, like said those words to you in his office that day? How did it feel? Man, it felt like anyone that's been in the weight room before squatting heavy or benching heavy, going into there, like that pressure felt like that. Uh, the pressure on the bar, whole bunch of weight just kind of pushing you down into the earth. And as soon as he said it, it was like the weight was lifted. I was light. I was like floating. Like whatever pressure that was there was instantly gone. Almost like it was like a magic trick almost. I don't know how to explain it other than like the words and he said and how he said it. It's kind of I don't care about any of those. Others. I just want the kid that I recruited. That's all. Mm-hmm. Nothing else. It sounds like the kids. It was a huge relief. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, me and Eric have talked about it in previous podcasts before. But you know, when you get on the stage, especially at Ohio State, you try to be obviously the best that you can be, and in doing so, you you start to almost try to play like someone else. If that makes sense, you want to implement their game and do the things that they do. When in reality, there's certain techniques or whatever it may be that you can take from other players. But ultimately, if you're not playing your game the way that you play it, it's not going to work out for you. You just have to be you. And I think that entire time I was trying to be, I was being me, but also trying to add an extra piece where it was like, you'll go a lot further just being yourself than trying to be someone else because you can only hold up that act for so long Mm -hmm. before it's like, y'all can't do it anymore. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But no one can be me. No one can be Nate Oliver. Can right. You? You right. I mean? So I think I do a pretty good job at being me. So it was just one of those things like just do it. Your God given talents and just who you are as an individual. Just be that. Mm-hmm. And everything I, releases. So. Nate, how would you describe that? How would you describe who you are? Off the field, on the field? Like, what do you Both. You both. Both. Man, I mean, it's hard to uh, describe, honestly. On the field, when I'm being me, I'm aggressive. I'm a leader out there. I'm doing the things I'm supposed to do in order for my team to win. I'm selfless. Like I said, very aggressive. I'm I'm the guy that's going to come down here and hit you. That's just uh-huh, me. Uh-huh. But off the field, I think that changes. Like it changes whether you're 21, 25, now I'm 34. So if I'm being honest, I'm kind of going through an entire process right now, which I'm still, I wouldn't say figuring out who I am. But more so, like really cementing, like, yo, these is, this is just kind of who, this is how I roll. 
this is just what I'm going to be. And I think for that, I mean, I don't know, down to earth, starting to realize that as much as people used to think that like, oh, Nate's such a huge extrovert, like he can just go out and just talk to everyone. Uh, I'm starting to realize that I'd rather just kind of stick to my, my circle and or be alone in a way oh, and, oh. and reading. But I also can be a life of the party. But I understand once I'm the life of the party, I need about two and a half weeks to recover from being in that spotlight just because I don't like that anymore. And honestly, I think that was probably part of uh, growing up and realizing like maybe me trying to be the life of the party and being an extrovert was a way for me, a way of me coping with something else. I yeah. really don't know. Hmm. But not saying I'm not a fun guy because I am, but yeah. <laughs> I'm also starting to realize that like, maybe it's because I'm getting older too, but I just really don't like being around people. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I'd rather be, my, be by myself and or around my circle where it's just kind of chill. I don't have to, you know, look over my shoulder or actually entertain so much. It's more so just me just relaxing, if that makes sense. For sure. I mean, it sounds like there's a level of performing and sort of being, yeah. you know, being a certain yeah. way. It takes a lot of energy when it's not you at that time in your life. And I think that developmentally it is the case for most humans that the younger we are, we have the more, we have a wide, wide range of friends and maybe not so deep or maybe just a few. But then as we get older, that becomes smaller and smaller, but deeper. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I'm just kind of just there, man. I, I don't know. I think it started... Uh, I really, I really started realizing it probably when I turned 30. Like, I don't know what it was about turning 30, but when I turned 30, I just, I stopped caring, if that makes sense. Like, not that I didn't care about people. Right. But like, I just didn't care. This person thought X, Y, Z about me. It's not going to affect me one way or the other. As long as I continue to do the right thing and I continue to be me, I can't yeah. control what that person thinks. It, it totally. is what it is. I mean, it sounded like, it's funny you say you started not caring, I get it, but I think it's also maybe on the other side of the coin, you started to care actually about the things that matter to you. That matter, yep, yep, yeah. that's, a good, that's a good way, yeah. You know, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. I get both sides, but I think what I'm hearing too is that there were a lot of relationships that were changing all at the same time, you know, for you as a young kid, I mean, you're 18, 19, right? It's transitioning from high school to college. All these losses, you know, change in the family dynamic constellation. And then you're leaving that supposed mm -hmm. to be, you know, like you said, on top of the world. You're, yep. you're an Ohio native going to play for Ohio football. Like what? Mm -hmm. Like people only dream of that, right? Exactly. And you're still not entirely happy, you know, mm -hmm. like. What do you think, what was going on for you at that? Like, how, how would you describe your emotional kind of well-being at that time? Well, it's funny that you would say that because as you were saying it, and I'm, I'm kind of reflecting back on it, it just now hit me. Like, I know you said, oh, there was so much going in, going on, 18, 19 year old kid. But like, for me, I went through so much as a kid that the stability I had was with, you know, my mom, my stepmom and my my dad in this house, right? So that was kind of the stability. So once that went away, then all of a sudden it was almost like back into chaos again, if that makes sense. So honestly, that's probably what happened. Now that I'm looking at it and now we're talking about it, that that's probably how why I spiraled and or uh, needed a moment to actually figure out, okay, build yourself back up again, get that foundation again get back left like level set again, if that makes sense. So yeah, there was just a lot going on. I mean, obviously a lot of people go through a lot of things and there was uh -huh. people who went through worse things than I had than I did. But there's also people that if I were to tell my life story up to right now, they'd probably look and say, I don't know how you're still standing. How is this even possible? Right. Hmm. So I just take life like at least now at 34, I'm kind of like, you know what, in life you're gonna go through many different things. But as long as you can figure out a way to, you know, continue just to show up and attempt to get better some way, somehow. Yeah. Like, I think that, that's really the most important thing. So, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. So you're, what you're sharing with me right now, and I, I really appreciate it, is that there was a chaotic period in your earlier childhood, it seemed. Mm -hmm. Then stability was found. And then chaos came again. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever and however we want to talk about that, you know, 
when chaos comes again, however people want to describe that in their lives, mm. it can trigger the previous chaos mm. yeah. and evoke some of those emotions and those experiences and those memories that maybe we've tried hard to maybe move through or not really have it impact us in a negative way. Yeah. But you have that, but then any kid going and transitioning to college, especially playing a sport and at a high, just a high level, it's already a lot. And then you have that going on, like, gosh. Mm-hmm. I mean, it makes a lot of sense that, you know, Coach Trust became that person for you. And thank God for him that he was who he was to you because yeah. I know not all football coaches are. And oh, yeah, not all absolutely. of them will talk to you like humans and appreciate that and like want to develop you as a young man. So like... Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, Coach Trust is amazing. I will say that. And I will say that I did a good job just from what I learned as a, as a kid. As even as I was transitioning to Ohio State, putting a smile on, if that makes sense. Like regardless of what's going on in the personal life, like the smile's still on. Like you'll never know. I think I told on uh, one of our podcasts, I can't remember. And he was kind of like, wait, what? I was like, yeah, it's true. But uh, when I moved down here to Ohio State in 2007, June 2007, me and my, my father had... Uh, words and there was kind of not only was the divorce happening but me and my dad kind of hit a rough patch and uh, when i moved into ohio state into my dorm i didn't have any of my clothes i had no clothes mm. like, i didn't have any clothes well, i shouldn't say any i had a book bag i had a couple shirts some shorts underwear socks they said yeah like two pairs of shoes and that was it now obviously i had more shoes at the house but i just again we were hit a rough patch and I couldn't go back to the house and there was just a lot going on. And if some teammates were to listen to this podcast, it'd be their first time hearing it because they, they didn't ever know. I didn't tell anybody because it was like, man, I don't want to put my problems on somebody else. I have to figure it out. All at 19, 18, 19 years old. So like when I tell you the transition, there was just so many things that were going on that I just kind of had to, you know, just for me, I felt like I just had to figure it out myself. If that mm-hmm. makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Looking back, you know, as a 30 year old man, looking back at that 18, 19 year old Nate, like, do you have a sense of the, of how that impacted you? Like to keep that smile on all the time and keep it to yourself? No. I mean, I'm sure. I mean, yeah, it definitely impacted in many ways because on the football field, for example, something bothered me and like I, I couldn't show emotion. So I kind of just smiled and shrugged it off. And looking back on it, from a coach's point of view, I'm sure that looked like, oh, this kid really just doesn't care as much as I thought he mm-hmm. cared. Like he's just able to shrug things off like that. But in reality, oh, I care very much. You know what I mean? But I just felt like I can't show it, if that makes sense. Because what would happen if you did? Looking back on it from 30 to looking at the, like a 30 year old looking back on it, I mean, probably should have showed the emotion so they mm-hmm. would have known that, oh, he does care. Great, cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what I mean? Compared to like, oh, this kid. He, he cares, but we're just not too sure, like, what's going on. I mean, if I can go and sit down with that kid right now, I'd be like, yo, you need to go and tell the coaches exactly what's happening. Tell them exactly uh, what's going on with your situation because there's resources for people in those situations in college, right? Uh, whether it's funding that you can get to go get clothes, X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. It's counselors that are available for you to talk these things out. And uh, had I done that, Probably at 18, 19, my college career probably would have been a little bit different. But also, I think there was a lot of lessons that I learned throughout that entire process that, yeah. you know, I can take with me right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. No, I appreciate it. I, I was envisioning you sitting with your little 18 and 19-year-old. Maybe not so little, but the younger yeah. 18 yeah. and 19-year-old. Yeah. 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 You, know? yeah. you know, having that conversation. And, you know, all of us at that age are very stubborn. We know everything, you know, we're egocentric, you know, and there's a, the pressure, the pressure, not knowing really how to handle it. And and that was the way you, you chose to handle and thought was right for you. And maybe it was, we'll never know. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I mean, like to be able to like, don't want to be judged, you know, as something other than what you want to show. And I, yeah. I think that it's a lot of energy, especially when it's not you potentially. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You no. Know? Mm -hmm. No, I think someone has to have, you know, in your situation, a lot of really important relationships to help support you to keep going, especially in that specific transition and throughout college. You know, Coach Trussell was one. Are there other 
um, relationships that you had and friendships that you had that were really meaningful to you and maybe still are? Yeah, I would say uh, my just really my teammates, but in particular, really my recruiting class, because those are the guys that you come into college with and or you're, you're going to graduate with or you're going to be friends with them probably for the rest of your life. So I would say my recruiting class probably did and served as family for me mm-hmm. the most. Obviously, other teammates did as well, but that 2007 recruiting class, for sure. I mean, Donnie Evage, uh, one of my 07 recruiting class members, uh, Solomon Thomas, uh, Cameron Hayward, who's now just balling out with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Like I said, that whole 07 recruiting class, I would say, outside of Coach Trestle. And then as I progressed through college, I would say uh, it was uh, my fraternity brothers. They helped out a lot. So yeah, man, I think that was that was pretty much it. Leaned on them. Yeah, that's and then, great. I mean, we're still friends, still talk to this day. I mean, yeah, that's kind of what it is. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. What fraternity are you part of? Mega Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated. Okay. Okay. Yep. yep. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know if Eric's gonna keep this segment, but like, I'm a Delta Delta. Sigma okay. 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 <laughs> See, there we go. There was the connection. There we go. There we go. Call me love for anybody else. That's, yeah. That's wondering. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. I mean, I think, you know, there's so many ways I can relate to your story and the importance of your brotherhood and my sisterhood to help us through college is so, so very, you know, important. I mean, that's important is an, un, I can't even find the word in the English language. Important is not enough. It's an understatement, but I, I love that you had that and still have that. Mm-hmm. It's really, really important. I know that while you were still at Ohio State, Coach Tussle did leave. Mm-hmm. Yep. Can you speak a little bit about what the circumstances of him leaving were? Yeah. So, man, it feels like it's forever now. It's 2023. Dang. Mm-hmm. So back in 2010, <laughs> wow, 13 years ago. Right. Where did, where right. did time go? But back in 2010, well, really started in 2009, but <laughs> the NCAA launched an investigation into the Ohio State football program because they thought we got free tattoos and selling memorabilia and all those things. And there were, I believe, five players that were suspended for the Sugar Bowl. I wish the Sugar Bowl was in January of 2011. And they were suspended from the Sugar Bowl. And this is how the whole, and this, the whole NCAA is just wild. That's why I'm kind of glad the players are getting paid right now. But yeah. I'm here then. So they were suspended from the Sugar Bowl. And then all of a sudden, like a week or so after the suspensions happened, the NCAA gave the okay for them to play in the game. So we're kind of like, okay, cool, we'll still be able to play. But also in the back of our minds, we're like, but what's going to happen, right? So we play in the game, we end up winning the Sugar Bowl, and then the investigation goes in, Coach Tresso has to go get interviewed, they interview the teammates, and then all of a sudden, NCAA says... The players are suspended for five or six games. I think it was six games because they played in the Sugar Bowl. But the NCAA allowed them to play. It was a money grab, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I said I'm so glad the players are getting paid now. But yeah. But uh, essentially, throughout this entire time, players are getting interviewed. Coach Tress was getting interviewed. And it almost felt as if ESPN, Sports Illustrated, Whatever media outlet out there was essentially trying to find any and everything to the point where they'd say something like, oh, there's also players that have unpaid parking tickets. Like they were finding any and everything to try to like make the program look horrible. And essentially, Coach Trestle fell in the sword. I remember uh, being up in Cleveland for. I forgot what weekend it was, but I was there on the weekend and I got a, a text from Coach Gillum and he was assistant to the head coach. Uh, but he sent a text out saying, hey, we're, there's going to be a team meeting in the morning. We know a lot of you guys are back home. So if you can't make it, no big deal. I just want to let you know that there's going to be a team meeting. So like, I just felt in my spirit, I already knew what was going to happen. So I got in the car and... Went back to Columbus from Cleveland at like 11.30 or 12 o'clock at night. Drove back, made the meeting. And before it was announced in the media, Coach Trestle came in and pretty much made the announcement that he's going to be resigning because 
you know, he felt like, you know, as long as I'm gone and I'll take the blame, everything should be fine. And he left and said that he loved us. And then he also said that, you know, we need to remember that no one's bigger than Ohio State, regardless of who it is. Like, no one's bigger than Ohio State. That was his message to us. So mm -hmm. we just kind of stuck. And then all of a sudden, the announcement on ESPN and ABC6 and all these other news outlets started basically saying, yeah, Coach Stressel resigned. And yeah, I mean, that whole thing was wild for many reasons, mostly because like I going through that as a player and I, I've seen a few different investigations go on as far as, you know, NCAA and different schools and violations or sanctions. But I really don't remember the NCAA really, really even going after a university the way that they did us, especially for what happened. Like, it was like every right. little thing they were go I mean, yeah. had a whole Sports Illustrated article talking about a whole bunch of everything. I mean, it was just a lot going on. I was like, God, me. And it was like, we were under a, a constant microscope going into my senior year. Coach Trussell resigned. Uh, Terrell Pryor, who was our quarterback, was essentially, he was essentially forced out of school, let's call it what it is. But again, he fell on the sword because he was like, well, if I stay, they're going to continue just trying to find anything. So he ended up leaving and uh, he uh, went through the supplemental draft and got drafted there and played in the NFL for a while. And uh, it worked out, but it was just a lot going on our senior year. It was at this point, right. we, we might as well make a movie. If I'm being <laughs> honest, there was so much going on that we could make a movie out of. Wow. Like, yeah. I mean, I know too, and I'm going to, I'm going to just take it here. You know, that of the players, there were five of them, right? That were suspended. They were all black athletes. You know, does that mean anything to you? Or does it make you pause at all? Like, or am I just kind of like seeing things a certain way right now? No, I think, uh, I mean, it just happened to be that all five were black, right? But that's not necessarily the issue. The issue was how far they came at us. Because of what happened, number one, that was number one. But number two, seeing some Ohio State fans, and this is when Twitter was getting, like, finally like, getting popular. Uh -huh. like, I, I really feel old saying that. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> right. As I said, I was like, this is probably someone like Twitter getting popular. God, he old is this guy. But, um, <laughs> yeah, like, Twitter was finally, get, or not finally, but it was getting popular. and. We were, the things that were said were like, I'm like, I'm gonna like, we're gonna kill you. You don't deserve, like, I hope you die. The fans were saying this? Yeah, on Twitter and everything. Yeah. Both on the regular Twitter page, like feed and direct messages to wow. any and everybody. Like, if your name was brought up in an article, which, I mean, my picture and name was brought up in like one of the first articles that they released before the suspensions came out. I mean, I had death threats and people saying X, Y, Z about me and my mom, my family, my this, that, that. I'm like, bro. Wow. So that was a whole other side that I was kind of like, well, I already knew based off of uh, the song Varsity Blues by Wale, like that song right there. Like we listen to it, but then you see what happened during uh, that whole investigation and how the fans were just not all fans, but the fans that were going in, like they went in and it really showed you that they really only care when you're playing football. Outside of that, you just kind of, you're there, if that makes sense. So, mm -hmm. so no, it's yeah. a lot. I mean, I think the fans can be cruel. The fans like might not fully understand everything and want to have a say in it. And, and I think the Buckeye fans, you know, like are it's special and different in a lot mm -hmm. of ways and very committed to their team. And so when something goes awry, they want to have something to say about it, like a lot of high-profile teams. But mm -hmm. I think, I mean, basically when you say, you know, both Pryor and Coach Trussell throwing themselves on the sword is like they took the blame for this sort of quote-unquote scandal that happened when players are just trying to 
get by, maybe make an extra buck and maybe not fully realizing the NCAA quote unquote rules or regulations about how that's illegal. I mean, it was an innocent. How do you view it? Man, there was so much. <laughs> no, there, I mean, there's the story for the entire thing is there's so much going on, but it's also not my story to tell. But part mm-hmm. of me is like, mm-hmm. I, I want to tell it, but like, I probably mm-hmm. should just wait off. But there was just so much going on. What I will say is, we only saw a part of it as far as what was shown on ESPN and said, yeah, they like, people didn't see the entire thing. You know, people don't understand like what happened. If gotcha. that makes sense. Gotcha. I think the Sports Illustrated article actually speaks on it a little bit, but yeah, it was there was a lot going on that mm-hmm. was beyond football that we um, all just kind of got were in the middle of, and it was just kind of like, oh, mm-hmm. here it is. If that makes sense. And again, a bunch of young collegiate athletes, you know, mm-hmm. young men trying to go to school and play football, like it's a lot to be involved in. Like, can you recall like your, the emotions that were going on for you at that time when Coach Trussell, you know, someone you're very close to resigns, prior resigns and just the whole upheaval of it. What emotions do you remember feeling? I I know for me, that weight that was lifted up off me, Mm -hmm. it's like as soon as you resigned, it was put right back on. Mm. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. So it was like, I was kind of like done. It was like a loss and a loss. But then also, there was, there was just a lot going on for me in general. So my grandmother at the time, she was going through her chemo treatments and whatnot. They decided that she didn't want to do them anymore. So my grandmother had passed away. Then Coach Tressa was leaving. And then my roommate, who was my roommate since freshman year, Cam Hayward, he was like, well, he entered the draft right after the Sugar Bowl because he was a senior. So that was a whole transition as well. So again, it was like almost like every couple of years, it's a big old transition for Nate. How's Nate gonna, yep. you know, it, it kept on happening, right? So yeah, it was just like a lot going on. That's the best way to describe it. But uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was tough. It was definitely tough. It was uh, it was something that you constantly had to like, you had a constant reminder. Because I promise you for a year, all they talked about was Ohio State and suspensions and wow, Coach Trestle resigning. And then even as we're trying to play the 2011 season, I believe I got interviewed by compliance and NCAA like four or five times that entire year. We had other teammates getting interviewed that entire year. And then during that year, we had other suspensions that were happening. And that entire year, so it was like we can't even focus on football, right? Because I don't right. know if I'm going to play Saturday or for the next two or three weeks. I I don't know what's happening. Mm-hmm. It was a constant, like under pressure, like yeah, stress. Really, is what you're describing. I yeah, think. it was stress. It was stress, but like on like oh yeah, it was on a whole another level. Like you just did not know. Gotcha. But, but like a different not knowing. If that made sense. But like a st- stress times a hundred, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and again, I'm sure other people go through other stress. There's a lot of tougher things that people go through. Than For sure. Whether or not you're going to play a football, football game on Saturday. Like, I understand that. But if that's our main thing and that's our objective and totally. we want to go play football, like, that's a lot. Totally. There's always someone who has you know, more stressful story or a less stressful story than your own. But to honor your own is important one. I mean, if I'm if I'm doing my math right, starting from your transition from high school to your freshman year, there there were seven losses that you incurred, including family members passing away, transitions yeah. of Cam leaving. I counted seven. That's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. It's- Again, I can't stress enough also the, you know, the age of, you know, at that time you're young, you know, you have two things on your mind, maybe three, including girls, but like school and football. (laughs) Let's be real. Yeah, that's what it was. But I think, and then to have like a third of you kind of questioned and poked at and undervalued and it's just, I keep saying it's a lot. You keep saying it's a lot. It is. Yeah. I just can't wait for 
all my teammates to get together and we just decide, hey, we're going to make a movie. And boom. And then Whoa. what happens? They're like, wait, did that really happen? And we're mm-hmm. like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. Yeah. I'll be in the front seat, if not yeah. behind the scenes, checking yeah. that in. Yeah. You know, we'll have to call it another name outside of Ohio State or something. But. Yeah. Call it something else. Call it something else. Oh, my God. Transitions, you know, are a lot for a lot of people, not to mention your losses, but I mean, transitions from high school to football and then after college. How would you describe, you know, that transition from graduating from college and then into life? And the best way to describe it is uh, being Superman, like the, mm. the superhero Superman, and then having all your powers stripped. Mm. And then all of a sudden, you got to figure out who you are. Mm. And no, you're not, you're not just Clark Kent working at Daily Planet or anything. Like, no, we're not doing any of that. Like, you have to figure out who you are outside of this. Because your entire life, you've been a football player. You've been told you're a football player. And you perfected a craft in order for you to get here. Yep. Now, all of a sudden, it's like, now you have to figure out how to go get a job. I don't have any job experience. These jobs that you're telling me to get, why am I, like, I get it's a paycheck, but I have no desire to do that. Mm. So it was tough. I mean, a lot, that transition is, I mean, the NCAA or somebody has to set up something for these kids because I know for me, mm. that transition is not for the faint of heart. Like there are there are some teammates that I know right now that are still going through that transition mentally and mm. trying to figure out, okay, who am I outside of football? Yeah. Some people, don't, they never figure it out. Like, yeah. I'm just stuck in this moment and just stuck. It's like, a, it's like Groundhog Day. You can't get out of it. You just oh. stay there. Mm-hmm. And uh, like for me, I guess I tried to figure out the next best thing, which was, okay, let me do personal training. And maybe I can do like position training with kids. Mm-hmm. And that's what I did for a while. But then all of a sudden it was like, this pays me money, but like I'm not really making any money. I mean, I'm making money, but like it's not necessarily a career to where I can uh, start a retirement and, you know, do everything I want to do. So um, then you go into the real world. Uh, well, for me, I'll just tell my story. I did the personal training thing and I was like, okay, personal training is cool, but I really don't know if this is what I want to do. And then all of a sudden, I got an email from a movie director who was like, hey, we're going to be shooting a movie up in Canton and we need former football players. Are you able to do it? I said, yeah, I can do it. And I have other people too. So we ended up shooting this movie called Underdogs. And oh. it was on, I want to say it was on Netflix. Okay. For, for a little bit. But it's a, it's a movie about the St. Thomas Aquinas football team. Okay. And like they were like god awful one year, then they got a new coach, and then you know, small town football team don't quite make the state championship, but then they go and play their crosstown rival in another game and they end up winning. And I was uh, actually in that movie, I played uh, a starting right guard and defensive end on St. Thomas Aquinas football team, so that was fun. And I was like, okay, I did my Hollywood thing, I'm super yeah. excited. <laughs> then I got another call from the same director and said, hey, shoot another movie. It's called Draft Day, and I need you to be a stunt devil for somebody. So I'm like, okay, cool. Good, let's do it. So we get up there, and he's like, yeah, so, you know, you're going to be a stunt double. And this guy, he, he's pretty good. He just did the movie uh, 42, and, you know, you're going to be his stunt double. Uh, his name's Chadwick Boseman. So I'm like, yeah. okay, cool. But cool, I'll, I'll be a stunt double. So... So yeah, so you're going to go to the Cleveland Browns facility. You're going to get fitted. You and Chad are going to be together, so go. So I spent like a half a day with Chad with Boseman getting fitted at the Browns facility. Wow. And uh, I was his stunt double on draft day when he was about to say that. So that, that was actually me. So I was like, oh, yeah, I'm making the Hollywood. I'm, I'm, I'll have to watch that over again. I have to watch yeah, those specific yeah. scenes, too. Like, yeah, so. Wow. So I was his stunt double on draft day. So wow. that was fun. And paid pretty good to be a stunt double, I will say. For every hit and every tackle you make, it's like a bump in pay. Oh, wow. Um, okay. 
Yeah, and then I was like, home and I was like, you know what? I think I'm gonna move out to LA, join SAG, and I think I'm gonna do the Hollywood thing. And then um a week later, I thought about it and I said, you know what? My body kind of hurt after making all those tattoos. <laughs> yeah. Don't really want to do the stunt devil uh, work. Right. Mm, no, I don't think I really want to do this. So I didn't move out to LA, but I did check off the item on my bucket list. And mm-hmm. it happened to be Chadwick Boseman, RIP to Chadwick Boseman. Yeah. Um, so I always tell people I was the original Black Panther before yeah. Black Panther <laughs> was. I was there, just so we were clear. And um, it's, it's true. It's a true story. I, I, I didn't make it up. It just said, you know? I love it. I love um, it. And then from there, I was like, okay, let me try the real world. So I was an assistant store manager at Walmart. Loved the associates. Did not like dealing with the people. But mm. because, man, they got... Here's the thing. I was the one, because of my personality, I would always get called up to the front desk to deal with customers. Okay. No one else would do it. No other assistant store manager would do it. They would, assistant manager, Nate, can you please go up to the front desk? And I already knew. I already knew. Was <laughs> so I had to be the negotiator and talk people down. So that's what I did. And from there, I was like, oh, okay, this is cool. I like retail, but I want to make more money. So I applied for positions with Elbrings and started working in the Bath and Body Works uh, warehouse in Columbus, hmm. Ohio. So Supervisor there, learned a lot about the business and warehousing and all that good stuff. And, and I was like, you know what? This is cool, but I don't know if I want to do this either. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. Mm-hmm. It was cool. And I was like, well, let me try sales. So I started selling life insurance. Well, I still do sell life insurance. Shameless plug, if anyone's looking for life insurance. <laughs> but anyway. Contact Manny Oliver if you're looking for some life insurance. Yes, absolutely. No, but uh, yeah, so I started selling life insurance and... That actually helps me a lot. If I'm being honest, that's, that's the closest to football that I can get, at least in the environment, because it's just set up like it's a lot. How we do sales, the competitive nature, the coaching that's available. Mm. To me, that's in, in it's like a purpose behind it. And it's not mm. just salary, but it's like, this is what you make off a commission, but it's uncapped. If you want to make $50,000, great. Or fifty thousand dollars, cool. But if you want to go and make two hundred and fifty thousand, you can go and do that. If you want to make oh, half a million, you can go and do that. Choice is yours, right? So mm-hmm. I like that the most. And, but in between time, as I was doing like insurance part time, I was working at Ohio State in the office of student life. So um, mm. in the office of student life, I was running the social entrepreneurship program. And essentially, I was helping students uh, build their businesses and helping them get in front of people that can possibly invest in their businesses as well. <laughs> so I did that for some years. But again, in higher ed, I knew it was only a season. And I was like, well, it's good to learn and great connections. But I'm in a position right now that I don't love. And there's someone whose dream job is to work in higher ed. And it's like, for me, I'm taking up space. Just want to be honest. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't my dream. So transitioned out to selling insurance full time. And then I'm also have a uh, logistics company, which really is for government procurement. So a lot of uh, products that we're doing. So that's pretty much what I do now. And that was a long winded answer, but <laughs> that would just show you what a football player goes through trying to figure out what he wants to do. No, I appreciate it. I, it was not long winded. It was, uh, I love the detail and I love like the kinds of jobs and your process to move from one job to another. I think it's interesting how you describe the insurance job as like closest to football with all those elements that you describe. I think that's cool. And I think, you know, athletes would want to find something that reminds them of the the person that they worked so hard to develop all their life and then had to leave just because it's time to graduate or an injury or something else. Like you wouldn't want to leave, I don't think. So you could get, still be in that atmosphere, not necessarily in sports, but maybe also in sports. For you, it's not. But there are a lot of, as you know, you know, jobs in sports that people can still have that experience and that feeling if that's what they want to do. But I love how unselfish you are. Like, oh, I'm taking the place of someone who actually, this is their dream and I'm going to exit state, right? Like that's... Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, 
I was around a lot of great people in higher ed, and they loved it. Like, they, but it's also what they went to school for. Like, yeah. they went to school specifically to be here to do this to make the impact on students. And I love impacting students as well. But like me compared to them, I can only look at it like I always tell kids, especially high school kids. I'm like, do you love football? Like, yeah, I love football. I was like, no, but like, do you love it? <laughs> like, yeah, I love it. Like, do you love it enough to like to play in college? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, so do you love it enough to wake up at 5 a.m. to go work out at 6 a.m. to shower, get dressed, to be at study table by 7.30 a.m. And after that, get to class at 9 and then try to go get some lunch before you go back to practice and then do it all over again. But before you do it all over again, Go to maybe another study hall so you can get your work done and study some more because you have a test the next day and then do it all over again. Do you love it that much or do you just like it? Because if, 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 if you don't love it, don't do it. This is a commitment. If you do not love this, don't do it. I mean, it's real. It's real. And a lot of people need to hear the realness of it because there's such a glorification, right? Um, oh, but the Ohio State football players probably don't do it like that because they're Ohio State football players. But like, no, it's probably even that and then some. But it's like people don't hear the real, real of that commitment that you have to love it. You have to love it. At Ohio State, everyone was an All-American coming out of high school. Mm. Like you, everyone's an All-American. But not just that, even if you get to the point where you're starting or you're a second teamer, you're still competing with Yourself, number one. Other people at Ohio State think all these other schools for a chance to go to the NFL, which each team only has 53 people on their active roster. Yep. Like, you're competing to be the best of the best. So if you don't love it, understand you're not going to make it. Mm -hmm. There's people in the NFL. I love this story. Devontae Davis, uh, he played cornerback for Illinois, then got drafted by... I forgot what team he got drafted by, but his last season, I believe he was with the Bills. And it was the first half of the game, a regular season game. And the team was driving on him. He ended up getting a pick to like end the half. So the Bills get in the locker room. Everyone's excited. He sits down and he just goes, Yeah, man, I think I'm done. <laughs> and they're like, Bro, what do you mean? You're it's done. He's like, right. He said, man, it's a young man's game. I'm done. Like, I don't play no more at halftime. And he's like, bro, are you serious? He said, yeah, bro, I'm not going back out there. Like, Vontae <laughs> Davis, like, he, he retired. To this day, they say he's the only football player that retired at halftime. He was like, yeah, I'm done. But that's what I mean. Like, if you don't love, like, you have to love. At like, that moment, he was like, mm -mm, I'm just playing. I don't even love this anymore. Like, I'm, mm -mm. I'm done. That's a story. Oh, my God. Well, let, let me ask you this. Can someone learn to love it? Yeah, I think you can. I think anyone can learn to love it. But that learning to love it starts at like a young age. You know what I mean? Like, it's very hard for you to learn. Well, when I say young age, it's like young as in playing the game, young age. Like some people start playing the game at fourth, fifth grade. Other people may not start playing until they're sophomores in high school. Uh -huh. But once you, you just learn to love the game. I mean, that's how I started. I did not want to play football at all. At yeah. all. My dad, my dad forced me to play football. I was a, I was a baseball player. Oh. To this day, baseball is my favorite sport. Wow. wow. I didn't want to play football. He forced me to play. Uh, my first year, I, every time I got the ball, I scored. And they were like, man, this kid is good. Man, this, this kid is going to go some places, man. Hey, Nate, man, how, how are you so good? To get my honest answer, like any other fifth grade kid who did not want to play football would give. It was, I'm afraid to get tackled. So I just run as fast as I can so <laughs> no one can tackle me. Like, that's, that's just, just being honest, like, no, I don't, I don't want to do it. Right, right. So I, I went from this kid that did not want to get tackled, didn't want to play the game, to playing defense and loving to just come downhill and hit people. You know, man, that's what I loved. Now, mm. for my two boys, when it comes to football, I'm kind of like, nah, we're going to play baseball, soccer. I'm about to put you in some STEM camps. 
We're gonna <laughs> we're, we're, we're learn how to code. That's what we're gonna learn. That's what we're... I was just gonna ask you. So thank you for volunteering. I was gonna say, like, for your kids, like, do, would you want them to play football? And there's the answer. Yeah, it's a young man's game, and uh, there's some kids out there. <laughs> Man, I don't like to say it like this, but like, my kids live a pretty good life. They have a good life. There's no way my kids would be able to compete on the field with the likes of me. <laughs> I mean, you can't do it. Like, we were we were too different in the like. You can't do. It. Like, you might get hurt. Like, I'm afraid yeah. you might get hurt. So you, I know you what you're talking about. If we break it down, though, but what you're talking about is the neighborhood and lifestyle and lived experiences. Actually, the mentality of actually, this is yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you, I mean, as a kid, I played football and I did these things. So because I had the vision and the drive to get my family, I knew who, I wanted to take care of my family. I want to do X, Y, Z. Like. Son, we're good. Like, <laughs> right. I don't have to go anywhere. Like, I'm, I'm, like, I'm great. We got you. You don't have to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And, but if they love the game, great. I think my youngest will probably end up playing football because that's my wild, that's my wild child. Like, mm. I can't, I can't tell him anything. I guess he'll, he'll be a football player if, but he won't play until high school. He'll play flag football up until then. Okay. And I'll try to pull him away from football as much as I can, but. If he wants to play, he can, but it won't be until high school. Why? Why? What? What's your thinking as a father and a former collegiate football player around that? Like, why flag okay. football first and then, yeah, pull them away? Flag, flag football allows this kid to actually learn how to move. Mm-hmm. Compared to if you go and watch these little league games, kids are four or five years old, big old helmets, big old shoulder pads. They're just sitting there and they're just running into each other and fucking. Like, yeah. Okay. No, True. no technique. Half the time, the kids are getting hurt because they don't know how to protect themselves when running into each other. Yep. And concussions. I mean, just to avoid those as much as possible. Now, obviously, it can happen to other sports, but I'm trying to avoid it as much as I can. But mostly body control. They need to learn how to move first. Uh So flag football, basketball teaches them how to move. Uh And then once you learn how to move, let's go ahead and do football afterwards. Uh Mm-hmm. That's just my my thought process. Somebody else may think differently, but that's just me. I mean, you know what it takes to be on the field. Like, do you fear for at least the little one for his safety playing football? I mean, there's always going to be a fear, whether it's playing football or I see him going to the jungle gym. Like, uh, there's always going to be a fear there, right? But... I mean, I just have to trust that he knows what he's going to do. And I also recognize that, you know, injuries are just, unfortunately, it's, it's part of the game. But after seeing those injuries, as well as if we're talking professional, looking at the contracts in the NFL compared to MLB, I'm kind of yeah. like, let's go baseball. <laughs> let's push you this way. Yeah. <laughs> let's go this way. But right. I mean, as long as the kids are well-rounded and they love it, I mean, that's all I care about. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. But definitely going to be pushing STEM and coding. Love it. And certain, certain things as far as, hey, if you want to go to college, cool, that's fine. You're going to major, you want to be an accountant? You're going to major in accounting? <laughs> no, you don't want to do that? That's okay. You're going to do computer engineering? <laughs> don't want to do that? Okay, you're going to go pre-med. So you don't want to do that? Okay, you're going to be a lawyer. That's fine. Okay, you don't want to do that? We're going to, we're going to talk about cybersecurity. There's certain things that I'm like, no. These are what's going to allow you to get paid in a, in a good way. And it gives you internships and things like that, especially cybersecurity. I know yeah. it's just been a, a tangent, but like, those are just kind of the things I think for my kids. No, I think, you know, we're both parents. I think that we, you know, a lot of parents want better for our kids than what we had, whatever that might look like. And that yeah. we know more now than probably our parents did um, mm-hmm. about what what it means to you know, be a successful, like, contributor to society, but also make a living and take care of your family. So yeah. I think that's what you're speaking to, you know, and, yeah. and I think any any parent would want that, right? Absolutely. Um, as we reflect on this conversation and the things that we've talked about today, you know, like, mm-hmm. what do you think are some of the major life lessons that you've learned, you know, mm-hmm. on the football field 
and how how you apply them to your life now, your your marriage, your family. Yeah, I would say uh, it goes back to a quote from uh, Mike Tyson that we had walking into the Woody Hayes Center. There was a big old quote from Mike Tyson. I believe it was Mike Tyson. Almost positive it was, but it's uh, everyone has a plan until they get hit. And then mm. what? Mm. So just to tie into what we talked about today and walking into the Woody Hayes and just life. I mean, everyone has a plan. Like, perfectly. Like, to write it all out sounds good. It's good to write those plans out, but understand, like, you're going to get punched in the face eventually. Mm. Whether you like it or not, whether you see it coming or not, the punches are coming. How you choose to respond to those punches, that's going to determine where you end up going. It doesn't mean that you're going to fail if you decide to make a wrong move after that punch. It just means, hey, it's going to take you a little bit more time to get up, you know, back on your feet to keep moving forward. But um, understand that those, those punches are going to happen. And then also, you know, being able to navigate it. I mean, one thing, whether it's the listeners or my kids, I'm going to tell them, you know, those punches are going to come. But when they do, just seek counsel, regardless of what it is, whether it's yeah. academics you're having trouble with, athletics, emotions. I don't care what it is. Whatever it is that's going on where you felt like I got punched, go uh-huh. see counsel. Because uh-huh. it's going be to be a lot easier for you to go ask someone who has probably already been through whatever it is that you're going through. They can navigate you through this thing saying, hey, don't do that. Do this instead. And this is the reason why. Yep. So that you can get back on course and get back to that plan a lot faster than you figuring it out yourself. Because, you know, I figured it out myself, unfortunately. And do I have the, the lessons and all? Yeah, I overcame. Cool. Yeah, I do. But if I can get you to overcome in one year compared to five, I think we're good. Or I can get you to overcome in one day compared to one month. No. Yeah. That changes, it changes the game. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's what I was saying. No, I love it. That's very wise. And I was thinking the same thing. I was like, Nate ain't talking to the listeners or his kids. He's talking to his younger self again, you know, mm-hmm. because you've learned that when you were young, if we were like to just kind of go come full circle now with our discussion here, that he, the young Nate, like kept it to himself. He didn't tell anybody. He put a smile on his face. He pretended it was all okay. And, you know, me as a professional in mental health know that that does take a toll. You know, we may never know how it's measured or in what way it comes out or doesn't come out and then grows or festers inside or whatever. Maybe hitting somebody super hard or like hit, making these tackles was a way to express yourself in a way you couldn't with your words. Who knows? But mm-hmm. you know now, looking back, that, gosh, if I had the wherewithal and maybe the counsel back then to be able to say, okay, like, shoot, I can talk to someone outside myself and get other perspectives, still make the decision on my own, but get other perspectives and other, other wisdom and other stories, maybe, you know, I can change it. But, you know, you learn from those just like we all do. And now you pass on that knowledge to other people, the people that you care about. And any, anyone who is listening is definitely going to, hear value in everything that you've said today. So I really appreciate you taking the time and sharing from your heart. And I've loved having this discussion with you. Absolutely. I love being here. Definitely appreciate you having me on. Eric's talked so much about your podcast. He did not let me know that you are a Delta, which I want to talk to him about that, but it's all good. Because <laughs> if I would have known that, if I would have known that, I would have used different language. Fraternity okay. brothers. And X, Y, Z, I would have been like my sayings, you know, to, to, you, you know, the language would have been a little different, but either way, we're, we're it, good. It's all good. It's all good. I know there's a little bit, and this is real, like the code would have switched in the yeah. different kind of conversation. It's a whole, you know, whole kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're good. We can do a retake, Nate. We can, I know. We can... hey, we just, listen, it is all good. We're fine. And, uh, <laughs> I believe uh, Eric is going to get you introduced to Jimmy, Jimmy Bell. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, it's that's my cool. that's no, my he's... chapter brand. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, chapter brand played at Ohio State too. So. Okay. Yeah, like I love how Eric, you know, has supported me in my podcast and like is helping me have more really important conversations like this one. Conversations that people don't get, you know, 
a chance to have an ear on to maybe learn from and take some real gems out there into the world and apply it differently. So I appreciate it. I know. Yeah. I think, you know, it's sweet. I think, you know, when I was talking to Eric earlier about you, he's like, you know what? I consider Nate a friend. I'm like, oh, oh. Hey, hey, <laughs> so, hey, Eric's the guy. That's my Eric guy. is great. I appreciate yeah. him. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much. I'll let you get back to your evening. Thank you for being here. Hopefully we get to connect again on another level on other things as well. Absolutely. We'll definitely stay in touch. Take care, Nate. All Thank right. you. All okay. right. Bye-bye. Athlete Mindset is part of the Source Podcast Network. At Source, we love podcasts. In fact, we love building podcasts, everything from development to production. Because of all that, we're growing this one-of-a-kind podcast network. If you have a podcast or looking to launch a new podcast, then we should talk. You can message me on Twitter at Eric underscore Kaz or hit us up any way that works for you by searching Kaz Source on your social media app of choice. Let's talk about your podcast joining this one-of-a-kind podcast network, the Kaz Source Podcast Network.